thank you, uh, Curtin University, for organizing this and giving me an opportunity to tell you about something which uh, I think is quite exciting and, and also uh, happened in my career. So I'm going to talk about quasars, their discovery, uh, and um, the key date here when a key paper was published in Nature was on the 16th of March, 1963. So that was 50 years ago, uh, last Saturday. And this is perhaps one of the biggest events which has happened in astronomy. Uh, there are a few other big events, but this one uh, has had a, a huge impact on the way we think about the universe uh, and on astronomers, and so I'm going to tell you some of that story, uh, quite a bit about how it happened, um, and uh, about some of the uh, machines that, uh, that led to it. As you see, uh, this issue of, uh, of Time magazine, Martin Schmidt, who was one of the key astronomers using the fabulous 200-inch optical telescope, biggest optical telescope in the world for many, many decades, uh, and uh, discovered the quasar. And that's the 50th anniversary, was on March 16. One of the huge paradigm shifts which was triggered by the discovery of quasars, and it's part of the story I'll tell you, was the realization that black holes weren't just a figment of the imagination of theorists, but are real objects which play an important role in the universe. So we'll get to that later. So why am I telling you this story? It's really pretty special to me because it was on March 1963, the month when uh, those papers came out in Nature, that I started my PhD in astronomy at the Australian National University. And uh, I used the facilities at the Parkes Radio Telescope and worked. Uh, my supervisor was John Bolton, who features throughout this story. So um, it has been my career, this 50 years of quasars, in fact, exactly. Here, uh, when I was a little, bit, uh, a little bit younger, in a jumper knitted by my wife, uh, well, wife-to-be, I hadn't uh, actually got married quite then, um, and I'm at the focus of a small telescope, a 60-foot telescope that's uh, near Parks and uh, was the interferometer I used in my thesis. That doesn't feature anymore. However, all of a sudden, radio astronomy caught the imagination of pretty much everyone. Uh, and the BBC, for example, filmed The Violent Universe. This was part of the realization that our universe is formed in many uh, very violent activities. Quasars are one, the Big Bang, of course, itself. Uh, stars exploding, making the elements from which you have all evolved. So this whole idea was really uh, uh, come to life, and especially with these radio observations I'll talk about. So, um, very brief summary here. And uh, uh, in going through these things, I, I've tried to cater for both... Uh, from time to time, uh, the scientists of you in the audience, I'm trying to use, when I can, simple language, and please, at least at the end, uh, ask me questions about anything. But we also, I'm delighted to see we have some young people in the audience, and so I hope you bear with me, because I'm also trying a little bit to make sure they can get some feel of what we're talking about as well. So the discovery of quasars is a bizarre story, it's nothing like the way you're taught that science progresses. Uh, it was full of wrong directions, mistakes, people uh, not understanding what they were seeing. And to me, that is a really important part of science. And the reason for looking at the history of science is it's no different today. We might think we understand all this, but we have things like dark matter, dark energy. And as you hear this story, those of you uh, either thinking or wanting to stretch your imaginations, think about the way that our uh, predecessors here went wrong and the way they made their mistakes, because we are surely making similar mistakes now, and the real directions are going to be different 
uh, from uh, what people think they are. The quasars brought the, the black holes into mainstream science and astronomy, and I'll talk a bit about that. And then uh, at the end, I'll give you only a glimpse, because it'll take me quite a bit of time to cover all the history, a glimpse of what we might do in the future. Now, this talk is going to have a fairly strong focus on the astronomy we do using radio wavelengths. You're more used to thinking uh, about what you see with your eyes, what you can photograph with a camera. That's the astronomy you do using visual light. But as this diagram on the left shows, there are many different uh, electromagnetic waves which come to us from space. And as astronomers, we usually can't go out and do experiments. We can only interpret the information that comes to us. So we want to use all the possible wavelengths. And you can see it goes uh, radio waves, infrared. Uh, there's the tiny little visible spectrum where um, all of our past knowledge came from, and then the ultraviolet and the x-ray. And I'll show you a few images at these wavelengths. But the radio is going to play an important role. And so why has radio been so important for discovering quasars? Well, the real reason are the two points here written on the screen. The brightest quasar in the sky, the one I'm, we're going to talk about a lot, 3C273, is the sixth strongest, brightest source in the sky um, in, at radio wavelengths. Uh, so if you're going through radio objects to find something interesting, you've only got to count down to number six, and you find a quasar. And as I will show you, numbers two, three, and four are incredibly interesting as well. However, if you're going to look at the stars that you see when you go out in the dark sky, you've got to get to three million before you find a quasar. So you've got to do an awful lot of searching. And that's really the reason why it was the radio wavelength that highlighted this very unusual phenomena. So here's a picture uh, taken through a reasonably good telescope of a piece of the Milky Way. Uh, like you would see uh, with, your, with your eyes um, at night and uh, the dark band across the center of the Milky Way and all the little dots sprinkled all over it. These are stars. These are stars like our sun further away, billions and billions uh, of them, as Carl Sagan would say. The radio sky, if you had radio eyes, looks totally different. And here is, a, is, is a, um, a recent picture of the radio sky. The band you see across the middle is our galaxy, and that's very bright in the radio. That's where, in light, you have the dark rift caused by all of the dust. Then outside of that, you see the haze, which is uh, radio emission coming from our entire galaxy. That was what was first detected. When, uh, when the universe was first seen in radio waves. And as you'll find out as I go through this talk, all the little spots sprinkled around the screen, they're not stars. The radio astronomers thought they were going to be stars, and that's going to be part of this story. They are almost all galaxies at huge distances. And so it's very different. So both universes are real, the universe you see with your eyes and this universe you see with the radio waves. And it's perhaps also interesting to think of the two wavelengths that we can observe through the atmosphere, it's the radio and the visible, why uh, uh, we've evolved to use eyes and light, but there's no biological uh, um, um, entity which actually uses radio waves to sense uh, or communicate. And um, two reasons for this. One is radio wave lengths are rather long, from centimeters to meters. They're, very con they're sort of a human size. But it's kind of difficult to build an optics system like your eye, which can work with radio waves. However, a piece of wire I meant to bring a piece, I forgot. Just a piece of wire will pick up radio waves, so that's not very complicated. But the other problem is uh, no biological system has been able to separate metallic uh, conductors 
out because of the uh, electric potentials involved. So even dinosaurs, uh, which were big enough, still didn't use radio waves. OK, let's go on. Now, uh, we're going to go through the entire universe uh, in looking at the story of the quasars. And uh, as I said, my apologies for some of you who, uh, who know all this, but I think it's uh, always useful to think about these scales again. Astronomers get quite used to talking about huge distances, small distances, and we do it often enough that it means something to us. But uh, unless you're used to doing that, the distances we talk about won't mean very much. But we are pretty good at thinking about how far back in time things happened. We can think about how long ago, uh, um, you know, when, uh, when, when various things happened, uh, you know, when, uh, when your grandfather was born, those are kind of time scales we can understand. And because uh, of the study of the Earth and the, the, and the rocks and the things on the Earth, uh, people have a pretty good feel for time. So the way we talk about the scale of the universe and make it fairly easy to understand is to talk about things in terms of how long it took the light to get here. Now, light travels pretty fast, 186,000 kilometers per second, uh, miles per second, sorry. So, for example, it can go all the way around, uh, around the Earth uh, in a seventh of a second. So we would call that uh, a seventh of a light second. That's the distance around the Earth. Uh, it takes light about eight minutes to get to the Earth from the Sun. So that's eight light minutes away. It takes about 40 minutes for the light to get from the planet Jupiter to the Earth. So that's 40 light minutes away. Uh, and then uh, within, uh, within an hour you've got a good, good part of the solar system. Um, then, big jump. Near a star, four light years. So we've got this little village of objects just here in the solar system, and then we have a big gap until we get to other stars, which very probably have solar systems too. So I'm just trying to get you that feel of how empty space is and how far away things are. Now as I go through my talk, every now and then I will tell you how far away things are using light years and giving some analogy to something that you can refer to. Okay. Now, the other thing I have to do is go back a little bit further in time to set the scene. Uh, this is our normal human time. So, during the war, there was a lot of developments of the kind of instruments you need to pick up radio waves. And Stanley Hay was uh, one of the key people doing this in the United Kingdom, using the strange little thing to the right there, which is the telescope he used. And what he discovered, amongst all the uh, radio emission coming from space, was in one part of the sky, in the constellation of Cygnus, uh, there was a spot which was fluctuating in intensity. And so that told him straight away, if it's going to be changing intensity, it cannot be on a time scale of uh, minutes in this case, uh, it cannot be more than a few light minutes across. Uh, because otherwise uh, one side of it wouldn't know what the other side was doing. So he was able to quite correctly say, that object has got to be pretty small. And uh, maybe it's even something like, uh, like our sun, but much further away. So that's when they started talking about radio stars. However, this brightest radio object in the sky, there was no nothing obviously visible there. There was nothing that you could see. Uh, so what was it? That wasn't known. Uh, and the question was asked, is all of that emission coming from the galaxy? Is that because there are lots of objects, lots of stars like this? And for the specialists here, just in case you don't remember, there was no theory for synchrotron emission, no th non-thermal radiation theory at that time. That didn't come for uh, uh, another uh, 10 plus years after this, before there was any knowledge of how these radio waves were made. So that was happening in Cambridge. 
At the end of the war, there were lots of people who had been involved in building radar for the Second World War, including a group in Australia. And I've picked uh, one lady, uh, Ruby Payne Scott, who is kind of special. You will find out there's quite a few characters in this story, and they're interesting people. And I'll talk a little bit about some of them. So Ruby Payne Scott had been working with CSIR in the radar systems that were developed in World War II. And these funny antennas here, one here, another one here that you see on the cliffs, and this is Dover Heights, just near uh, Sydney Harbour. Uh, they were antennas that had been used for doing uh, World War II radar. But what they put together was a very clever scheme. Here's the antenna here. It's this guy sitting on top of the cliff. And when you look up at the sky, you might see the radio waves coming in down here but there'd be a reflected one which would come bounce off the sea and you would also see that. And these two radio waves would interfere with each other. Uh, this was a standard thing done by the radar people off the ships doing radar. They would see the direct reflection. They would also get one bounced off the sea and that already worked out from that interference pattern. You could calculate quite accurately the angle. Now, radio waves are very long, so determining exactly where they came from was quite difficult, and this was one of the ways of doing it. When the sun comes up, it's daylight, of course, you can't see the stars at all. At radio wavelengths, the sun is reasonably bright, but it isn't the brightest thing in the sky normally, and you wouldn't have the day-night difference at radio waves that you have uh, in light. But every now and then, uh, the sun was making quite a lot of radio waves, and this was known. And so Ruby used this system to try and work out where are those radio waves coming from on the sun. Are they coming from the whole disk of the sun? The sun isn't actually hot enough to make the radio waves by uh, processes that were known. And uh, this is what they found in the radio. Uh, this is an image. Usually I'll show you modern images rather than the ones from the time because they're more interesting, more exciting. So this is an image of where the radio emission comes from. And it turns out it was coming from the sunspots. And it was Ruby Payne Scott, first woman uh, radio astronomer, who actually deduced that. So the radio waves were actually coming from these little tiny spots on the sun. Now as we get better telescopes, we look in the UV and we look from satellites from above the atmosphere, what it was actually finding with these incredible loops. There are huge magnetic explosions in the sun. And as that material explodes out of the surface, there's a lot of particles, high energy electrons, and they were the ones that were making the radio waves. Now the step that's important for my story here, I'm not gonna say any more about the sun, but this was the first time people connected radio waves with explosive events happening out there in space. It wasn't the actual heat of the sun making the radio waves it does make some radio waves. It was these explosions and radio waves are very easily excited by explosive activity. So what were these other radio sources like the small one that, uh, that Hay had found? And I'm going through this story because it mimics what's going to happen in the Quasar story a bit later. Uh, people were getting most of the interpretation wrong. They'd found one small radio source, that was correct, and then they jumped to the conclusion that all of the radio emission would be made of those. They had seen these sunspots making radio flares, and so they thought, ah, other stars are going to have even bigger sunspots, and so these radio waves will all be coming from maybe better stars than our sun, ones that are more violent. Uh, and that was the model that prevailed for almost a decade. As you will see, it was completely wrong. Um, they got two steps wrong. The unresolved emission wasn't the stars, and the one star that they had studied well, which was the sun, was not an example of any of the things that were to come. Now, the story of what was to come next involves an expedition by another group um, that was working in CSIR in, in Australia. Um, and they had been looking not at the sun, but at some of these radio sources to measure their accurate position so that they could try and work out what is it out there in space that's making all these radio signals. 
But with just one cliff at Dover Heights, they could only get one piece of information from the interference pattern. So they went to New Zealand. And New Zealand has wonderful cliffs, and it has them on both the east and the west coast. Here is a, uh, a little portable antenna that was shipped across to New Zealand. John Bolton, who was my supervisor, by the way, later after this, and Gordon Stanley set this up in New Zealand uh, on a place called Packery Hill, which is on a cliff above Lee. Uh, that's kind of famous because the piano, the film, was filmed on, that on the beach just below that cliff. That's got nothing to do with the story, of course. Um, so what happens, they've drawn one line in the sky from the Australian observations and saying those radio sources lie somewhere along that line. The New Zealand expedition, which was completely successful, drew another line. Now you look where the two lines cross, and if you look at that point up in space, that's where you should find something. And the four strongest sources in the sky they could see the one in Cygnus, I already told you about. There was a strong source in the constellation of Taurus, one in the constellation of Virgo, one in Centaurus. They measured four positions, and they got the surprise of their life. The one in Taurus turned out to be pointing at something that's called the Crab Nebula. There's a beautiful new image made with a VLA, which I'm showing, rather than, of course, the very crude image they had at the time. And that is in the position where the Chinese saw a star explode in 1054 AD. And uh, this star was so bright that it was easily visible. When we get the next supernova that close in our galaxy, everybody will see a bright star appear. But it only happens every three or four hundred years, so who knows when. But the Chinese recorded this one as a guest star. We're now looking at things much further away. The light from this one left when the pyramids were being built 6,000 years ago. So I've taken a pretty big jump already. We've gone from the nearest stars, and we don't find an interesting radio source until we get out to 6,000 light years away. So we are jumping out in space in huge steps. And this is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. Let's put the Hubble Space Telescope and point it at it. And that's what we see in optical light with the Hubble Telescope. It all matches up beautifully. But this object, you could have an entire lecture about. In the middle of that, this is a telescope which takes pictures in the X-ray and um, has produced this incredible picture, something swirling around in the center, and in fact, something that is in, indeed a jet poking out of it. You point a radio telescope at it, connect it to uh, the earphones, or even connect it to a loudspeaker if you're a radio astronomer, and when you point at it, there are the radio pulses coming from the center of this object. And that is um, an object which is rotating once every beat in that sound. And I won't tell you much about that story, but, uh, um, but it's a thing called a neutron star. As I said, it's an entirely different lecture. So there you can see that this detection of this particular radio source just led to such a wealth of phenomena. And, uh, and just think for a moment something, the mass of our sun spinning at the rate at which you could hear uh, that, uh, that, that pulse. All right, let's go to the next one they measured. The brightest source in the constellation of Centaurus. Lo and behold, there's this incredibly beautiful uh, but rather strange galaxy, NGC 5128. Now we have, assuming that's a galaxy, moved totally out of our entire galaxy. That light left 10 million light years ago. For that object, we are back at when uh, the first humans uh, were evolving uh, on Earth. And the radio emission in a modern image looks like this. There's a spot in the middle, and the, the radio plasma seems to be funneled out from the center. 
But it's way more dramatic even than that, because let's try and get the scale right. And I've got to shrink this image way down. This is an object the size of our entire galaxy. And then when we do a modern radio image, uh, this is what we see. So there's an object out there generating radio waves, which is hundreds of times bigger than our entire galaxy. So right away, these radio waves were picking up some absolutely remarkable things out there in the universe. Um, here are the three people that were involved in that uh, paper which measured the first positions. Uh, John Bolton, uh, Gordon Stanley, and Bruce Lee. They had just discovered a couple of the most important discoveries in astronomy. The Crab Nebula, they nailed it, they got it right. But this Centaurus A, hundreds of times more luminous than our galaxy, hundreds of times bigger than our galaxy, who's ever going to believe this? This, this, this? this maybe can't be real. Um, John Bolton told me when I was a student, and this is an example also of how people can misremember, uh, they had problems with the referees. So they had to put this statement in the paper that says it's a pretty weird galaxy. It's got this funny dust lane across it. So maybe it's really in our galaxy after all, and the optical astronomers have got it wrong. Uh, that's the statement in the paper. John says, ah, just had to do that for the referees. Of course we knew what was going on. But uh, in those days, people wrote letters, and some of those letters still exist, and you can find them. And my colleague, Miller Goss in particular, has been doing the research in the archives and came across this little gem, which was written uh, just at the time, a few months after that paper was submitted by John Bolton, and he's writing to somebody called Rudolf Minkowski at Caltech, one of the top scientists working on galaxies in the world. And what it says is, in a letter to Nature, written before I had a chance to consult with you, I have suggested that these objects may be within our own galaxy on the basis that a close freak is more probable than a large collection of freaks at great distance. You see, as soon as they acknowledged it was at great distance, all the others were going to be at great distance too. And this was a step too far. They weren't at that point willing to make that step. But who did he have to talk to? He says, this galaxy looks weird to me. He's a radio engineer. He's not even an astronomer. So you say, oh, well, you talk to somebody next door who knows about galaxies. In 1949 in Australia, there wasn't anybody who knew about galaxies. Close to zero. So he's got nobody to tell him, that's a real galaxy. It's not going uh, to be in our galaxy. And Minkowski replied immediately saying, come on, you have found a galaxy. And this is way more incredible than what you even said in nature. So the message here was, you need to have this network of connections to people who know about all kinds of things. That group in Australia had worked on the sun and they did know a bit about supernova remnants and exploding stars. But there was nobody in the group who knew anything about galaxies. And so they missed, um, in fact, in terms of the paper, uh, they missed this incredible discovery. Everybody who knew about galaxies, it was within months that the original story was changed. Everybody knew that galaxies were detected perhaps with the exception of Martin Ryle, he hung on a bit longer for our Cambridge friends. So by uh, five years later, these things are being called radio galaxies, and they are being found by the dozens. And every time you measure an accurate position, you find a big galaxy, uh, often with these lobes like the ones shown here outside. And finally, in 1954, the brightest one in the sky, which is this one called Cygnus A, was discovered. And as you see, it's a bit like the picture I showed you of Centaurus A. Now, these things are another factor of 10 further away. 
we are now back to the light leaving in the age of the dinosaurs. So if you're thinking back in time, we have gone that much further out in the universe and we're seeing all of these objects. Um, here is uh, Walter Bada and Minkowski, both the experts in what galaxies were and the people who were using the great 200-inch and 100-inch telescopes at Palomar to study them. What they saw in the middle here, in the photograph here taken with the 200-inch, Minkowski, well, Bada first, but, um, and Minkowski together, they thought it looks like two galaxies have banged into each other. And they came up with the theory that they were colliding galaxies. And it's when two entire galaxies crash into each other, that's what provides all the energy to make these incredibly luminous sources. So now they knew that the radio could pick up these things, so the next step was people want to see things further and further away. So the idea was find really small radio sources and they're going to be at even greater distance because the further away things are, the smaller uh, they're going to be. So there was a huge team of people started measuring the sizes of radio sources. I uh, should have included, they're doing this on the famous Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank. Um, and they're finding the really small ones. They're measuring accurate positions of some of those small objects because if you're trying to find something very small, like a star, and your position is only as good as that, you've got lots of choices. And to study all of them with a 200-inch telescope is actually impossible because it takes sometimes all night to get a spectrum of each of them. So they had to get much better positions. They were doing that with an interferometer at the Owens Valley in California. An interferometer built by no less than the same John Bolton who discovered the radio galaxies. See, the Americans after the war didn't go into radio astronomy, and they fell behind the UK, Europe, and Australia. So they actually got John Bolton to come to Caltech to build a radio astronomy observatory there for them. So that's also interesting in case you imagine that Australia is the underdog. Sometimes yes, but sometimes not. So John Bolton built that, and one of the ideas was to use those two telescopes to get the interference pattern to measure the accurate positions. And there's John Bolton again, and one of his students, Tom Matthews, got the position for object number 48 in the Cambridge catalog. And this turns out to be a pretty interesting object. So once they had nailed which star-like object it was, they got a spectrum of it with a 200-inch, and across the bottom are uh, uh, three of the luminaries uh, in, in measuring light from, from objects uh, in, out in, uh, in, in astronomy, out in space. Uh, Jesse Greenstein, uh, Guido Munch was involved in this, uh, and here's Alan Sandage, famous for the cosmology you could do with the 200 inch. So they got a spectrum of 3C48. It had lots and lots of what we call emission lines. You analyze the light from a star, you can tell what kind of elements are in it because they, uh, they make what's called lines in the spectrum. I guess I'll show you one in a minute. Um, and you can tell what kind of elements they are. And if the object is moving, you can measure the Doppler shift and see how fast it's moving. So they measured, there were lots of lines in the spectrum. They couldn't work out what they were. And in 1960, Alan Sandage here uh, has a paper to the, AA, the American Astronomical Society meeting saying there's this weird object with weird lines. Possibly it could be a remote uh, galaxy of stars with some strange redshift, but it's most likely that this really is a star in our galaxy. So here they go, they're actually heading down exactly the same path and the same trap that we had already seen before. And furthermore, this object was variable, like in the beginning of my talk, the one in Cygnus. And if something varies, then it can't be very big. And this thing was changing in its optical brightness from night to night. So the thinking was, if it was distant as a galaxy, 
then uh, it would have, and you can see it, it would have to have as much light as all of the stars in an entire galaxy. So here's the object, 3C48. If they imagine, this is a very distant version of this galaxy. Oh, that's what I did. Good. Um, then, if it varies in a week, that means that every star in the galaxy would have had to vary in a week. And of course, that's, that's nonsense. How could that possibly happen? They can't possibly know about each other. There are thousands of, uh, of, of light years uh, apart. So the view was, because of the variability, this cannot be an extragalactic object. It has to be something nearby. Uh, and so that was the situation in 1960. Um, and it was considered to be the first radio star. Greenstein, one of the uh, most famous spectroscopists, an expert in analyzing what the light means, how you can go from the light to what kind of elements and what kind of conditions there were that made it. And he had written a paper for the Astrophysical Journal uh, with totally weird kinds of elements in a very weird kind of star that uh, he thought might be some off, uh, offshoot of the, of the uh, stellar evolution process. So, and the paper had been accepted by APJ but hadn't came, come out yet. By the way, from this point on, things are happening really fast. Um, and even though there's no email in this era, just think about that also a little bit, uh, people are writing aerograms back and forth on a time scale of about a week. The groups in Caltech, Manchester, Australia are all talking to each other. And there's a lot going on. And you'll see there's a lot packed into the next five minutes of my talk. A hell of a lot happens uh, really fast now. Um, well, this John Bolton, who had gone to Caltech to build that Owens Valley Radio Observatory, uh, had decided to return to Australia, uh, which he did. And in a history which John wrote in uh, 1989, he made a statement saying that this 3C48 uh, could have been fit with a redshift of 0.37. Now, I already gave you one example of the same John Bolton, in fact, uh, telling us what he change he made in a paper because of a referee, and that was, maybe the referee was tough as well, but it was a small misremembery of what had happened. So everybody said, ah, John is making it up. Nobody knew that it had that redshift. Well, guess what's been found in the archive of letters? And my God, what are we going to do in the email age? Who's going to actually find these gems among the millions of worthless bits of information that clog up all of our databases? Well, think about that, too. Um, here's John Bolton. Uh, he's actually left, uh, and I think he was in Hawaii. He was on a boat to Australia. And he's written this letter to Joe Pawsey, who would, have be, would be his boss when he arrives uh, in Australia. I thought we had a star. But it is not a star. Measurements on a high dispersion spectrum suggest that these various lines, neon, argon, uh, need a redshift of 0.367. Um, the absolute magnitude is then minus 24, which is two magnitudes brighter than anything known. So he did do it, and he wrote it down. This is, uh, this is 60, so this actually is is three years before the discovery of quasars. This was a quasar, no doubt about it. But one month later, he writes another letter. Oh, that's right. This letter, he was still at Caltech. A month later, he writes saying, no, uh, the experts have told me that these lines are not possible. It can't have this kind of ionization. Such an object can't exist. I was wrong. So must be a star after all. So that was the effect of having the most expert person in the world saying what that spectrum was. So this is an example of too much knowledge becomes a problem. Previously, we had the problem with the galaxy. It was too little knowledge. Here, clearly, there was too much knowledge. And uh, now, let's proceed into the next step.
This is the Parkes uh, radio telescope, uh, and uh, we were actually observing the moon when this beautiful photograph was taken by Seth Shostak. I was inside, so I'm very proud of it. We were looking for high-energy neutrinos, but that's something totally different. It's got the telescope and the moon. Now, if a radio source goes behind the moon, then if you time very exactly when the radio source disappears and when it reappears, you can measure an incredibly accurate position. So this was an alternate way of being able to pin down the identifications of some of these radio sources. And thank you, Divier, I stole that from your PowerPoint presentation the other day. Uh, Cyril Hazard had become the master of doing these occultations. He was doing it at Jodrell Bank, using what's now called the Lovell Telescope. But um, he had come to Australia, and he was aware of the fact that a source called number 273 in the third Cambridge catalog was going to be occulted by the moon, and that would be visible from Australia, not from the northern hemisphere. So he asked if he, he could get access to CSIRO's radio telescope to observe this occultation, and it was, uh, there were actually uh, a sequence of occultations throughout 1962, Here's one of, uh, of about six. Um, uh, in this case, the radio source is emerging from the side of the moon. Uh, down here, you see nothing. Then you see an increase. Then you see a little step, which turns out to be real, and that's part of uh, what I'll show you next. Then it continues to increase, and then you get this beautiful diffraction pattern. It is an absolute classic knife-edge frenal diffraction. It's the radio waves being diffracted because they're half blocked by the moon and half not. So it's a classic diffraction pattern. That tells you straight away that the thing that's been um, um, occulted by the moon has got to be extremely small to make this pattern. And it also tells you it's got another lump in it, and that lump doesn't come with a pattern. So that other lump has got to be not small. So they put all these observations together. They can draw this little picture. So in this direction of the sky, there is a point source, which is making this pattern. And down here, there's another blob, which has to be a little bit elongated. Here's the photograph taken with a 200-inch. Uh, and now, by the way, this is, um, this is happening in February, by now, 63 and lots of things are happening very quick, quickly. They knew this source was going to be occulted, so they had already got a good quality photograph with the 200 inch. But this is what they found. Previously, they thought this source was identified with a completely different object. This very point-like object is that star. And see a little faint wisp? That's exactly where the other thing has to land. The first thing the optical astronomers thought of when they saw this was, well, uh, we've got a mixture here. This must be a background very faint galaxy. And this is going to be another one. Whoops, where's my pointer gone? And this is going to be another one of these galactic stars. And it's just a chance coincidence. That was the first reaction. Um, August 62. Uh, Martin Schmidt gets the photograph I showed you. Martin Schmidt had come from the Netherlands, and by the way, that is absolute typical Martin Schmidt. Anytime you meet him, it'll be looking elegant with a bow tie. I've never not seen Martin with his bow tie. Um, he'd come, Minkowski had just retired, and he was taking over the program on the 200 inch to measure faint galaxies. And so his job would really be to try and see what that faint, wispy thing was. But it was immediately obvious from the occultation that there was radio emission from the star and from the wisp. Uh, Martin said he took, a pit, took the spectrum of the star first because he wanted to get that out of the way, and then he'd do the difficult job of trying to get the wisp. But when he took the spectrum of the star, this is the spectrum down here, it's now February uh, the 5th. He's actually taken the spectrum uh, in December. He looks at it straight away. All of these black bands are these emission lines I told you about. There's something in the star, which is some elements which are making these lines. 
They didn't make any sense. They didn't make any sense to Martin Schmidt. But he straight away said, it's another thing like 3C48 which doesn't make sense. But he didn't know about the high redshift of 3C48. And then in, uh, he was then writing the paper up to put together with the occultation paper, put it in nature. And he went back and he looked at the spectrum again. And he suddenly saw that this line, this line, this line, and a faint one you can't see in here, but you can see on a different spectrum, uh, were in a certain ratio. And it suddenly realized it was the Bama sequence of hydrogen lines if you multiply them by 1.16. So if you gave them a huge redshift, they all fell into place. And not only that, this is now science making predictions. Here's a hypothesis. If that thing was going at this incredible velocity, then the lines would all fall in that place. A guy called Bev Oak had an infrared spectrograph. And then you can predict that the strongest line of all, which is uh, H alpha, would be in the infrared. He looked spot on. So there's almost no doubt at that point. They have found the redshift of this thing. Next door is Greenstein's office. So Martin says, hey, look at this. This thing looks a bit like your 3C48, but I know what its redshift is. And Jesse Greenstein says, oh, shit. Uh, cancel his paper in AppJ, and uh, within uh, days had written another paper on the second quasar, 3C48, which indeed had a redshift of 0.37, which was what John Bolton had said but was talked out of three years ago. So, the bizarre twists and turns. Now, these quasars, they are really bright, and if the redshift is part of the expanding universe, now, now, so many billion light years away, we are actually talking about the first life evidence of life on Earth. So we're now out to about 10% uh, of the age of the, of the Earth and the universe. Uh, so we have suddenly gone to these vast, uh, vast distances in space. Uh, that's a summary. And furthermore, this thing wasn't just as bright as a galaxy it was a hundred times brighter than the most luminous galaxy known. And of course, that is what triggered my opening slide and uh, uh, the uh, enormous excitement about the quasars. There's a bit of a problem. This is one of the major discoveries. There's no Nobel Prize for discovering quasars. But if you've been listening to my story, you can see it's a very confused story. Who discovered 3C273? And in fact, We've been trying to find who was actually the first person that said, looked at that 200-inch photograph and said, the star and the jet line up. Martin Schmidt says, this was not me. I just observed the thing that you guys told me to look at. Tom Matthews, who he says did it, Tom Matthews says, no, I didn't do it at all. Uh, so did, uh, did Cyril Hazard do it? Um, but Cyril Hazard, there's no evidence, but he almost certainly didn't, and so on. And probably, I think John Bolton did. Minkowski was in Australia. He had a copy of that picture with him. But I'm not sure we're ever going to find out who actually identified it. But as you can see, there's so many people involved and so many steps. Uh, the Nobel Committee doesn't handle that very well when giving out Nobels. To move uh, from there to the future, here's a sketch of what they thought the radio emission looked like based on that occultation. Small thing up here. And uh, down here, a more extended object. And the other piece of the sketch, which is actually being done by Jan Oort in the Netherlands. Oh, by the way, there's people in Australia talking to the people at Caltech, talking to the people at Manchester, here talking to Jan Oort in the Netherlands. This is international game. This is a world game. This is not played by any one group. And the information to sort this out is spread over all these places around the world. This is international science, which is my other thing I love and working very well. Um, so this is what they measured. Uh, for those of you who study uh, radio emission from AGN, this is the paradigm AGN. Uh, they measured the spectrum. They had a number of frequencies. The compact one is flat. This thing down here is steep. That was the first time that was found in a radio source. This is where it started with that occultation. 
There is a modern image taken with a VLA, and so you see they got it pretty good in the uh, old occultation record. So 30 years later, with a big fancy telescope, uh, you get perhaps a better picture. And then you look at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is what you see. It's a beautiful picture with the very bright quasar up here, and here's the optical jet broken out into a whole string of knots, and uh, today we still try to understand exactly what's going on, especially in the jet. But we will mostly now talk about what's going on in these stars. Um, today we call them quasars. The astronomers didn't um, introduce that term. It was a uh, popularizer of science, uh, writing in physics today, got sick of writing quasi-stellar radio sources and called them quasars. But the journal, uh, APJ in particular, uh, refused to use the word quasar. And there's a little story here which uh, comes from Martin Schmidt. He then decided there were optically loud, uh, optically radio loud, radio quiet quasars, and they needed different names, and he wanted a term to apply to everything. So he wrote a paper to APJ and said, we really got to use this term. And here's the reply by Chandra Seker, um, pointing out that this uh, very reputable journal hadn't used this uh, popular term, um, but uh, they feel that it can no longer be ignored. So that's when quasars came into the literature. These things were bright. They were relatively easy to observe. You didn't even need a 200 inch. And look what happened immediately after 1963. This thing called Z is proportional to how far away they are. And so there was a race, basically, of people all over the world trying to find an object at the greatest distance. So there was a huge amount of activity um, and going up to, uh, as you can see, redshifts are seven, which we believe is the time in the universe when quasars were probably first made. None have been found beyond that. And beyond that, we now have other things, gamma ray bursts, but I won't talk about that. This same uh, quasar had a few other surprises, and I just wanted to show you this one quickly. Um, if you look at this picture, it shows images taken of this quasar with its, uh, with its jet. It's the very central part of it. And the uh, pictures are taken about once every year. And the sizes in light years are written on. Does anybody see that there's something pretty unusual, amazing about this photograph? In a time scale of roughly a year, this thing keeps changing in size by five or six light years. That means it's been expanding at five or six times the speed of light. That was what was observed. Is this a problem or not for uh, special relativity? The answer is not, because you can do it with, uh, with an optical illusion. And I think you either know about this or else I don't have time to explain it. But because the objects are moving apart at about the speed of light and the light is coming to us at the speed of light, you can make an illusion in which you get this apparent expansion. But of course, there's another nature paper and, and a whole business of measuring what's called now the superluminal expansions in AGN. But I wanted to look at a different aspect of the discovery of quasars. So just recapitulating, Parks uh, did the occultation, Schmidt got the spectrum, and I'm actually sitting at Caltech at about this point in time, and I was watching what I thought was an incredible collision of two cultures. Astronomers all of a sudden had to get in bed with general relativity theorists, a kind of theorist that a normal astronomer would not even think about talking to because you had no idea what they were talking about. These were the theorists who work on Einstein's theory of general relativity and space-time and coordinate transformations and what was generally thought to be pretty weird stuff. But the quasars caused something enormously interesting to happen. Because how did you get this much energy, not now from an entire galaxy, but from a small region? Remember, it fluctuated night to night. It's only a few light days across. You've got to get this energy, not from an entire galaxy, but from a very small region. And uh, if you think about that, 
There's only one source of energy which works, and it's gravity by having an incredibly massive object in the nucleus of the galaxy. By December in that same year, a symposium had been convened. I hear you can't work this fast. It was the first Texas symposium on relativistic astrophysics. If you're interested in history and excitement, you read this and it bubbles with the excitement that's going on in, in that year, 1963. And here's a statement, uh, a quote, uh, which was attributed to Fred Hoyle, I assume it is. So relativists, with their sophisticated work, were not only magnificent cultural ornaments, but might actually be useful to science. So there was a transformation occurring. The other thing that was happening, this is in the nucleus of a galaxy. Well, everybody now thinks, well, of course, the nucleus of the galaxy, that's where the action's all going to be. What's surprising about that? Well, the surprising thing is that this was a big surprise. Carl Seifert, perhaps one of the best-known astronomers these days, because there's things called Seifert galaxies, which are named after him, which are hugely uh, important. In 1943, he made a catalog of them, small catalog. He had six of them. For 16 years, his paper received not a single citation. And that's even worse than most of the statistics we worry about. And furthermore, when he did get some citations, none of them came from the West. Not from all the people working on galaxies in Europe or the US, but from old uh, Victor Ambatsumian, who said, the nuclei of galaxies aren't just the place where they're brightest. Maybe something important is happening there. Uh, and followed a few years later by uh, Vitaly Ginzburg, who got the Nobel Prize, by the way, for superconductivity. Uh, think broad, look at many subjects. As far as I can tell, he is the first one that said gravity can supply the energy. He's not normally credited with it, but I think you'll find it was probably him. So if you get into the nucleus of galaxy and you've got a lot of gravity, you can really make things happen. Very quickly, all of the old ideas of colliding galaxies to provide the energy disappeared uh, within a year. I would say they were gone. One controversy lasted for decades. That was a rather strange one. A subset of the scientists said, objects cannot naturally be that luminous. This is unreasonable. We would rather have a redshift due to some phenomena we don't understand. So we'll invent something like dark energy, and say that's going to explain away the redshift and not have to put them at great distance. That persisted for quite a long time. It's interesting that theories which were making good sense um, were nevertheless so different from what anybody was thinking that they were considered um, less credible than a theory that you made up saying, well, we don't understand what the redshift is, so that'll be magic, and let's go on from there. Uh, not surprisingly, the magic theories failed to predict much, anything. Whereas the gravitational energy from collapsed objects uh, had become a really big thing. And in the years, 60, even in 62, 63, there are papers by a string of people saying, Gravity can do wonderful things. There could be accretion disks around massive objects. But notice I've said, what kind of object? Nearly all these people are saying, really massive objects. Maybe you can have a star, which is a million times more massive than our sun. And then it could, uh, could accrete this stuff and we could get all the energy. But what about the black holes? You all know about black holes now. But black holes then were even more esoteric than other bits of general relativity. And it's also 50 years, this week, since black holes became credible. Have a very quick look at the black hole history. We can go way back. Chandrasekhar said, this is Chandrasekhar, eventually the editor of AppJ, by the way, in 1931, young, uh, young, uh, young scientist, a star of a large mass cannot pass into a white dwarf stage and one is left speculating on other possibilities. 
The idea is if something is so massive that its gravity overcomes the atomic repulsion forces, what happens to it? And so he's wondering what happens. The expert, here's the authority, steps in. Uh, Eddington is basically saying there's going to be something in nature to stop crazy things happening. It's, it's not going to turn into a black hole or anything weird like this. There will be some law of nature because that would be totally weird. Um, Oppenheimer, more famous for his uh, role in the uh, development of the atomic bomb, uh, worked for many years on the theory of black holes. Um, and he called it an exercise in abstraction. Uh, and most of the theory was there, but was considered to be irrelevant and wildly speculative. I also thought it was interesting when Chandrasekhar eventually got his Nobel Prize, and you read the citation, uh, the citation was for his work on, on white dwarfs, neutron stars, but included in the citation is this statement that he had predicted that there would be black hole, but in the Nobel Committee, there are still so-called black holes in 83. Uh, Kavli Prize, 2008, Schmidt for the discovery of quasars, and then they added Donald Linden Bell. Now what my friend Donald added to the story was a couple of rather interesting steps. Uh, he wasn't the first one to come up with the idea that if you had a black hole and things accreted onto it, you'd get lots of energy. But he did realize there were so many of those things out there in space, and the black hole, all the mass may have been used up. You may have big black holes which aren't doing anything. So he said maybe all the galaxies may have to have black holes in them. Otherwise, we can't explain the number of quasars seen at great distance. And so that was when the nuclei now were not only weird occasionally, when they had these blasts of energy in AGN, but maybe all the nuclei, maybe even our galaxy, has a black hole in it. I also thought it relevant to pop this in. This is the VLA, the, uh, one of the largest radio telescopes uh, on Earth at the moment. Um, and when you build a radio telescope, you have to make up a story of what you're building it for. The VLA was built to observe quasars with optical resolution. So if the quasars hadn't been discovered, I guess we wouldn't have had a VLA. Now, VLA did observe quasars with optical resolution, but it did a hell of a lot more. Uh, Lyndon Bell said, hey, look in the center of our galaxy. There might be a black hole there. Center of our galaxy is a pretty messy place. Here's a picture of it which I was involved in making, but I don't have time to talk about. And at really high resolution, a little white dot there. And when you do uh, look at the stars in the infrared, where you can see through the dust, and what this is showing, the different dates, is the way these stars are all looping around the galactic center. You can apply Newtonian mechanics, and you can work out there is indeed, at exactly that point there, a black hole with three million times the mass of the sun. And uh, I was going to get the movie of this, but I didn't get around to it, which looks quite dramatic. But it reminded me of these little uh, black hole machines where you drop the coin, right, and it circles around and around and around and goes down the black hole. Uh, and so that's a very nice illustration of just what's happening in the galaxy. And by the way, all this gas you see is just spiraling around the hole as it goes down into the black hole. But when I looked up this image, or actually my wife found it for me, um, there was an amazing caption on it. It said, these things uh, may gather more money than any of the uh, other sponsorship devices which are out there. And so for the commercial people here, here's a spin-off from black holes, and excuse the, uh, the pun. Uh, they are making money, because the shape of that is designed based on a black hole. Here's a beautiful picture of a couple of galaxies colliding with each other and uh, swirling off uh, the stars and doing a kind of dance before they finally merge. Well, if each of these have a nucleus, and here in this picture you can see they do in the Hubble picture, uh, and they each have black holes, then you're going to have two black holes in orbit around each other. And if there are two black holes in orbit, that gives interesting possibilities. Um, because they can generate gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves can be sensed 
by timing pulsars and see the distortion in space and time as the gravity wave goes past. And this is how I'm now moving quickly to the future. And here's a plot which says, can we see these gravity waves? Uh, well, in, in, of all of the places in Australia, Perth in Western Australia is where much of the research on detecting gravity waves has been done. Um, there's a machine in Perth uh, like uh, LIGO to try and detect them. This has got to do with the frequency and big black holes have a different frequency than small black holes. These pulsar, and these are the predictions all along here, and these little loopy things are the limits. None have been detected yet. These are looking at pulsars today and the best you can do. And the next one in here is what this telescope called the SKA will do. And it should get us to the point where we'll see these double black holes orbiting around each other because of the gravita gravitational waves they make. In order to do this kind of experiment, we now need telescopes which are an order of magnitude bigger than what we had before. So we have to go from the VLA to things like the SKA. And here's an artist's impression of one part of the SKA as it may, uh, may look like uh, um, in, uh, in Western Australia. And uh, in conclusion, let me just comment on these new telescopes. Of course, there are many things it can do. I showed you just one tiny example because it linked into the black hole talk. Um, but like the VLA, it will not just image quasars. These telescopes will test the predictions we're making. But the exciting thing, and I think the exciting thing about this story is, it's not the old questions which we're answering, but it's the new things which they are going to find for which we don't know anything about yet. And I think the quasar story has got this interesting twist in the tail. The power of science is surely its ability to make predictions which you can test. That's the foundation of science and why it works. But don't get confused. Science itself evolves in completely unpredictable ways. So we cannot predict what the exciting science will be in the future, but we have every reason to believe that it will be just as exciting as the period I've just told you about. Thank you.